ICAS Food, which is the International Panel of Experts on Food Security. Um, they have decided that Torino uh, was going to be the first place or the first laboratory uh, for a research engagement network meeting of a group of bottom-up people involved in the food sector who try to think at what it means to have sustainable food policies and how to make sustainable food policies a reality. So again, besides being in the com scientific committee of the International University College Masters on Food Law and Finance, it's also here because tomorrow IPS Food will be co-hosting this meeting with around 50 people from the entire food chain to talk about how uh, sustainable food policies can become a, a reality. So I'm very, very pleased to, to have you here, Olivia, and thanks a lot for all the support to the uh, IUCS program and, and the college and to the, for the support to the uh, work on food policies. Uh, you have as much time as you want. I think they're going to kick us out at 7, probably. No, 7.45. Okay, so you have even more time <laughs> than I was expecting. Um, so, so the... Up to you how much you want to talk uh, on reinventing food democracy and what we should all be thinking and doing in the future. And then QA and then drinks and pleasant time. Thanks a lot again. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Uh, to all for being here this this evening. Um, what I would like to do in maybe maybe an hour uh, before opening for discussion is to try to understand the current situation of food activism and how it relates to food democracy. And yes, uh, Tommaso Ferrando is is right that uh, this is directly linked to what IPS Food, the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, is trying to achieve, promoting the idea that we need, at all levels, food policies, at the municipal level, at the national level, at the European Union level. And I'm delighted to see my friend Andrea Calori, who just left the room, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to have this exchange tomorrow around food policy in today. And this is, in a way, linked to what I'm going to discuss this evening, because I believe these policies should be much more open than they've been until now to the social innovations coming from citizens-led transitions, rather than being top-down, rather than being technocratic, rather than being governed from above, as we've been used to thinking social change um, in our society. Let me perhaps uh, start by trying to understand what is happening. I, of course, apologize to my students for um, having heard, for, have, for repeating myself in front of them, but as you'll see, there are some changes, and, and this is a snappy uh, and fast presentation of things we've been discussing at greater length. What is happening? What you have is a number of social innovations that um, combine political advocacy for change in food systems with um, real social innovations that are experimenting with new ideas to change food systems from, from below. There are many examples, many of which uh, you are familiar with and even are actors of, including community-supported agriculture and uh, urban uh, agriculture, uh, the development of collective vegetable gardens, um, the um, um, growing of vegetables that people are free to, um, to, to use, uh, to, to, to choose from, um, transforming foods, uh, food into, into a commons, uh, a theme that, of course, is very dear to the heart of Jose Luis Rivero. Uh, we have, um, um, in, the, in the Germany, this is one thing I discovered recently, the, the Lebensmittelretter, who are the saviors of what is essential for life, right? Saving food. Um, and they um, collect um, uh, uh, food items that people shall not be consuming, they put them in fridges that people freely open to serve themselves, and supermarkets also uh, get uh, uh, rid of what they shall not be selling by this means, uh, allowing people to um, have access to food by this means. We have, in many uh, cities in Europe and elsewhere, we have um, seen the development of collective vegetable gardens. This is, for example, one rooftop in, 
in Brussels, the roof of a public uh, uh, library. Um, we have um, uh, also social groceries uh, where people have access to relatively low priced but high quality organic locally produced foods. Um, and the prices are competitive and even lower than the market price simply because people commit a few hours per week uh, to uh, uh, supporting the life of the social um, uh, grocery, the supermarket, um, as has been done since 1972 in Brooklyn with the um, Park Slope Food Corp, for example, uh, that has inaugurated the system that's now developing in, in Paris with La Louvre and in Brussels with Bisco and in other places. What we see is that all these um, innovations um, are combined, or often are combined at least, with the creation of new political spaces. In other terms, people do things, they develop new social practices, but they also um, occupy new spaces in order to transform um, the politics uh, of food and to create the conditions that shall allow these social innovations to develop. Sometimes um, these new political spaces are invented by the activists themselves who set up, for example, food policy councils and sometimes they are um, uh, uh, created by the authorities who provide a forum where people can um, uh, discuss how food systems should be reformed in order to become more sustainable. And what I would like to emphasize is that this, this way of being an activist in food systems it's very different from the kind of activism that we had in the 1960s or 70s, for example, where people were trying to transform society um, uh, very often by um, either trying to influence state power and, and, and trying to mobilize in political parties and, and in unions, or by developing new lifestyles but without any interest for politics. Um, and I think we are, what's interesting and new here is that we have a combination of both. Um, I'd like to highlight maybe um, three major advantages uh, or promises or potentials um, for these new citizens-led social innovations. The first one is that, um, very simply, we have a, a much greater diversity of approaches um, to how to feed cities, to how to recycle waste, uh, to how to um, feed people um, who have um, low incomes and cannot have access to adequate diets. We have um, a multiplication of solutions, what I call a social diversity developing, just like we are in favor of biodiversity because it creates a portfolio of solutions we can choose from for the future. We have a diversity of social innovations that can allow us to um, essentially find new solutions to emerging problems and be much better equipped and much more resilient um, in the face of the crisis that we shall be facing in the future. So that's one major advantage. The very fact of diversity, I think, is a sort of insurance uh, uh, that you are taking against uh, future risks that the definition are unknown and difficult to calculate. A second advantage, a second promising dimension of these developments is that um, people, uh, in whichever capacity they interact with the food system, given this new diversity that is emerging, they have to take responsibility for their choices. Um, as, a, as a farmer, they have to choose whether to go through the big commodity buyers and the big retailers, or whether to sell on farmers' markets or to enter into these nested markets that Yado of the Fluke, for example, has been uh, studying. As consumers, as eaters, people have to choose whether they go to the you know, nearby supermarket where um, in one single central place they will have access to a, a large uh, number of, of, of goods, uh, apparently very um, diverse, or whether instead they want to and buy their food from a local producer and, and uh, uh, enter into community-supported agricultural schemes, for example. So instead of this idea that we are just one small actor in a very long chain in which we have uh, been disempowered because the system is so much larger than we are, 
instead people are forced to take responsibility and they have to make choices and to accept the consequences of the messages that they are sending by producing in a particular way or by eating in a particular way. And then thirdly, what's also very interesting is that these social innovations, they come from the appetite of the people themselves for change. In other terms, it's not something imposed on them. No one is forced to join these new social innovations. And that's um, very promising because for many years, we've been thinking of social change as something that was only possible if it was imposed from above by regulations or supported by economic incentives, a combination of tax and subsidies that um, allow the economic benefits to be aligned with you know, positively connotated social uh, outcomes. Instead, um, here, we don't have these economic incentives or these top-down regulations imposed on people. People do change, but they change because they believe uh, that they have a role in making change happen. And that, to me, is, is very promising. Um, because it, it appears from recent studies on behavioral change, particularly the studies promoted by these authors, uh, Edward Decky and Richard Ryan, um, that um, uh, the change that results from people developing new values, new attitudes, new convictions, uh, shall be much more um, resilient, persistent, than the change that is imposed on people from above. What Decky and Ryan do is that they compare the change resulting from the imposition from outside or from above of change, imposing so-called extrinsic motivations on people, penalties, rewards, sanctions. They contrast this with the intrinsic motivations that people have to do certain things. And when people are intimately convinced that there are things they want to do behaviors they want to change, they shall change even if the circumstances evolve, even if the economic incentives are not rewarding them anymore, even if the sanction is not threatening them anymore. Um, they will be inventive in um, developing solutions that will allow them to remain faithful to their values and to um, um, act in accordance with their convictions. And basically what um, Edward Decke and Richard Ryan developed under the label of self-determination theory is the idea that the best way to effectuate lasting change in people's behavior is by giving them freedom to choose, what they call autonomy, by giving them the skills, the tools, the knowledge they need in order to be able to make a difference, that's what they call competence, and giving them um, um, the, the sense that by making a change they um, build their link to community social networks that they want to belong to what Becky and Ryan call relatedness. So autonomy, competence, relatedness are three conditions that encourage people to basically develop their own solutions to make change happen uh, by changing their behavior. If they have this they shall have the will, the motivation, the um, stamina to engage in change, and they will have a better performance as um, um, activists in society. They will persist in uh, the behavior they've chosen for themselves, and they shall be imaginative, creative, in overcoming obstacles to change. And this is a framework um, that they applied in a number of areas, including to understand changes in eating behavior, right? So people who want to save the planet by consuming less meat, people who want to um, um, have a better health by having a more balanced diet, people who want to support farmers by sourcing their food from local small-scale producers are people that shall have a behavior that shall persist in time, that shall be uh, resistant to, to changes in circumstances if people um, really believe in what they're doing. And that is more effective than to sanction people for not doing the right thing or to reward them for doing the right thing. So for all these reasons, I think we have to um, 
find ways to transform politics, governance, democracy to support social innovations and food systems. And um, to do so, I would like to try with you to understand not just um, what is new, but why it is happening now. And why what is happening now is different from what happened in the 1950s and 60s, 70s or 80s. And I'd like to suggest basing myself very, mu very much on the work of Albert Hirschman, um, an economist, uh, but very, um, um, very influenced by um, uh, various social sciences, including sociology and, and psychology. I would like to propose a hypothesis, building on Hirschman's work, but developing it further, because of course Hirschman could not work until today, unfortunately, but he did look at these two first periods, um, the 50s and 60s, and then the activism typical of the years 1968, when Berkeley was going down in, in flames, almost, um, Paris probably was, um, until the, the, the late 1970s. Um, and what I would like to, 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 to say is that each of these periods is characterized by a specific form of activism, or the lack thereof, and that you cannot understand each of these moments without seeing where people come from and what is the experience they relate to. Now, Albert Hirschman... Um, published in 1970 his most influential book called Exit, Voice and Loyalty. The subtitle is Responses to Decline in Firms, Organizations and States. And Exit, Voice and Loyalty was a book about how people reacted to the disappointment they felt when they bought a product that was not as good they expected it to be. Um, they wanted to protest against the fact that the car was not working as well as they hoped for, or that the, the book was not as good as they had anticipated. And what Hirschman said is, well, people basically have a choice between either exit or voice. Unless, of course, they remain loyal and they don't change, they will either switch to another product, right? Buy a different car, buy a different book, send a message to the producer service provider that the product was not satisfactory, or they will complain and write a letter to complain about the product. And so he was looking at these different um, uh, choices people had and how they related to one another. So basically what Hirschman was doing was, again, writing in 1970, writing about dissatisfaction within consumerism, right? People have a choice between a large number of goods, they are disappointed by one thing, they move to another, and as, you know, well-responding economic agents, they send a message to the system that actually they've been disappointed and are turning to something else. And the book by Hirschman was extraordinarily influential because, for a sim very simple reason, he was an economist, and economists usually look at exits, right? Because they look at consumers who switch from one product to another, right? They don't like Colgate as a, as a, um, uh, a toothpaste, and so they switch to Elmex. Um, that's what's going on. And he was adding the viewpoint of a political scientist. People actually can also write to Colgate saying, I don't like your toothpaste. It doesn't taste good. And so he was combining exit uh, with voice. So that was the idea. And, and the idea was people are actually sending a message within the system by their purchasing choices. Now, interesting, but time passed, and 12 years later, Hirschman published another book, Shifting Involvements, Private Interests in Public Action. And that book, 1982, looked at the period of the 1970s during which people actually surprisingly turned to public action, political activism. Um, how come? They were not just consumers anymore, they were also citizens, 
right? So they expressed in the 1970s, not just as consumers, their preference between different products, they expressed their dissatisfaction with consumerism as a way of life. Moving from being just consumers to becoming citizens. Moving from the private realm to public action. And very interestingly in this book, Churchman asks, how on earth is this possible? How come people are not simply happy to move from Ford to Toyota, or from Colgate to Elmex, but also move from changing the toothpaste to taking the streets, right? And, and, and marching against the war in Vietnam. And he puts forward a number of reasons. I would like to highlight four reasons which I believe explain this shift to public action during this period, the 70s. First, um, in 1974, Tibor Skidowski, an economist at Stanford, publishes a fantastic book called The Joyless Economy. Subtitle is The Psychology of Human Satisfaction. It's very underestimated, but a hugely um, interesting book. Um, because it's not just the, 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 the ruminations of um, uh, an economist uh, going with pension and free, therefore, to write against, against his trade. It's also a very empirically informed study of why people act as they do on market. And what essentially Tibor Skitovsky says is people are not content with reaching a certain level of satisfaction only. And of course, people want comfort, you know, they want a, 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 a level of satisfaction of their, um, their tastes or desires. But more importantly, people want change. They want to move from discomfort to comfort. So, for example, um, people have more pleasure from being hungry and eating to be full than they have pleasure from just not being hungry. Or, to take another metaphor, people have more pleasure from accelerating and reaching a certain speed than being at that speed riding on the highway. Right? So the basic framework Skitovsky was using was the distinction between pleasure, which is moving from discomfort to comfort, and comfort. When people are comfortable in all respects, you know, they live in a room with the right temperature, they've just eaten, they've drank enough, they've, they've read the book they wanted to read, they, and then boredom comes in, right? They then are just satisfied and they are not enjoying themselves anymore because there's, their life is dull. And actually I think that if Tibor Skidowski wrote this in 1974, it was in part because he sensed that in the society of the early 1970s, people were bored. All families had a fridge, all families had a car, perhaps a second, all families had a color TV. All families um, had, you know, all the amenities that makes life comfortable, but dull and uninteresting. And the first reason why in the 1970s people turned to public action is simply because consumerism had been satisfied and they were not interested um, 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 anymore in... Um, the, the, the promises of, you know, ever more comfort being provided to them. There was a second reason. And just a couple of years after Skitovsky published his book, Fred Hirsch uh, published The Social Limits to Growth. Again, hugely, inf well, actually much more influential than Tibor Skitovsky um, uh, a couple of years before. And... Um, Fred Hirsch made two very important points, I think still important today. One is um, that people are dissatisfied with consumerism because they have a large number of consumer goods to choose from and um, to enjoy, but they don't have all the time it would require to really enjoy those goods. I completely understand. I mean, there are so many books 
I've accumulated without having time to read them. How frustrating. There are so many places I could travel to that I've never visited. So many people I would have the means, the, the financial means to visit. And I simply don't have enough time to spend with them. In other terms, our possibilities of, you know, doing more face one limiting factor, which is the time we have at our disposal to enjoy it. So that's a source of permanent frustration. And, and, and you may give to people even more possibilities of consumption. They shall not be able to enjoy it more. In fact, it will increase even further their degree of frustration. And then, he put forward a second idea, which is still very influential, that of positional goods. Many goods that we enjoy as consumers actually are not so enjoyable because of the use value they procure, in other terms, their utility to our lives. They are useful because you show the social status you've achieved. But if everyone has this good, it's not very attractive anymore, right? If everyone has a car, your car is not very useful as a, as a, as a uh, social symbol, right? Um, if everyone has the same um, level of uh, consumption, all the pleasure you have, you know, competing with the Joneses is, is, is lost. And so that is a social limit to growth, right? We can continue to grow. Our felicity, our happiness shall not increase commensurately. Okay? And so I think Skitowski and, and Hirsch, it's not by accident that they were writing in the 1970s. They, f they highlighted some very, I think, real problems with the promises of the consumption society, consumer society, la société de consommation. And no wonder if people then turn to something else. Now, I'd like to add, add two arguments, or two elements of the period. First, the late 1960s and early 1970s is the period during which people became aware of the environmental impacts of the lifestyles that developed with the consumption society. The Limits to Growth, published by Meadows and others uh, at the request of the Club of Rome, appeared then. Silent Spring of Rachel Carson appeared in 1967. I mean, you, you know this. And so, for the first time, people realized that expanding consumption might actually destroy the planet. And, I mean, you all feel a bit guilty, don't you, when you take your individual car, when you fly an airplane. And, and I think this discomfort, this psychological dis uh, dissonance is something people have difficulties living with. The feeling of guilt accompanies the act of consumption for the first time. I think it's a major explanation for why people in the 70s moved away from giving themselves as an objective to improve the possibilities of material consumption. Fourth and finally, the 1970s witnessed the start of the economic crisis, right? The oil crisis, 1973, unemployment began to kick in in 74, 75, and so on. So, for someone who's 20 year old at that time, uh, it's not, it was not clear it would be so easy to get a well-paid job. It was not clear they would uh, you know, achieve better than their parents. And so, wasn't it foolish to put too many hopes in increasing the you know, levels of material consumption? Was it not more promising to invest in public action? Right? And so this is, these are probably a number of reasons, of course, combined, why people have shifted to activism in the 1970s. Some of these reasons were highlighted by Hirschman, the others are my own um, um, uh, suggestions, but we certainly um, um, need to explain why this is the period when people were not just dissatisfied within consumerism, but with consumerism as an ideology of progress. Then we have a third period, and that is one I, I can boast that I know firsthand. It's my generation. Um, it's a generation that I describe as having retreated to privatization, private preoccupations. The 1980s and 1990s, and here uh, Hirschman did not 
comment on this period, so we have to do without him. We have to try to understand why people retreated to consumption, to individualism, away from political activism during this period. And that is what happened. Um, um, this is the period during which, when you were 20, you wanted to have a car, you wanted to have a well-paid job, you were dreaming of making money, you were not a political activist, that was not something people at 20 years old were doing at the time. I know this, I graduated from law school in 1990. So, what happened here? I think um, there are two key explanations for this retreat back to the private. First of all, um, we have um, a situation in which people um, were caught in a trap in which leisure was more and more about consumption and was more and more expensive. Many ways in which in the past people were using their leisure time became the subject of consumption and free time was used spending money not necessarily going shopping, but paying for, you know, the, 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 the theater uh, um, or, or for trips and expensive things and so on. And leisure was essentially either to spend the money you made working or to recuperate from work. But it was not anymore um, to develop new competences, new talents for own production. And so you had to invest more in work and in making money. This is, after all, the way you achieve social status, because that is how you can finance your leisure time. This has not always been so. In the past, people had leisure time they were using to stitch clothes, uh, to build or, or, or improve their houses, uh, to um, learn new skills, and to reduce, although that was not the objective, that was the consequence, reduce their dependency on market relations. But now they are caught in a trap in which it's always more expensive to spend interesting leisure and therefore you have to make money and invest in work and that is the, the couple that dominates lives and the time left for civic, civic action is minimal. That is actually what Cornelius Castoriadis and André Gortz were explaining in the 1980s um, and Castoriadis coined the term privatization to describe this, um, this predicament. And I think it's, 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 it's very true. Um, it goes together with um, uh, an increased specialization of tasks in work and um, um, an impoverishment of our lives because we are very skilled at doing a very small number of things that we forgot uh, to entertain uh, many other skills that in the past were part of what we were doing in our free time. One author, the sociologist Robert Putnam of Harvard University, wrote a very important book in, in 2000, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community, in which he tried to understand the reason why in the US people had become more and more individualistic in their lifestyles, doing less things together, spending less time in associations, um, uh, spending less time in you know, evening meetings of unions and, and neighborhood associations, but um, um, developing um, um, a, a taste for doing things alone, including going to the bowling. And it's a very um, um, stimulating book because he comes up with figures showing through, I mean, literally 50 or 60 indicators, this <coughs> decline of collective action, of social community, of what he calls social capital in the US. And he shows, this is just one indicator amongst many others, that after the peak of the 1960s, people retreated back to the private. Um, um, and um, 
that decline accelerated in the 1980s and 90s. He wrote his book in 2000. Why? Well, Putnam actually provides some answers, but by no means uh, the full range of answers we need. Based on his inquiry, and I have no time, of course, to go through his methodology that um, may be worth discussing, but essentially he came up with three major explanations and then added two explanations that are less convincing, le less convincing. Um, and so there's a part of this chain that remains to be uh, explained. So first of all, he says, work has taken um, a more, a, an important uh, space in our existence, and he actually provides figures. Um, he calculates that about 17% of the decline in social capital has to do with the fact that people are work obsessed. Um, in part, this is because our social status is defined by the work we occupy and the money we make. And in part, it's because work is more and more demanding, the market is more and more competitive, so there's pressure on you, and, and therefore, when you are not working anymore, you, you want to just... Um, do other things that are relaxing rather than invest in community action. And so that's one part of the explanation, not surprising. The second part is more new, um, is that people have um, greater distances now than in the, say, 50s or 60s between where they live, where they work, where their kin children go to school, where they buy things in shopping malls outside the city, where they do sports, etc., or where they travel to for vacation. So the time spent commuting from one place to another is more important. And actually, there's one calculation in the book by Putnam uh, that says that for each hour per week you spend commuting, right, driving your car or taking your train to work and back from work, there's 10% less you, in you invest um, in. Um, um, civic action, right, with neighbors. You simply have less time and less incentive to do so when you are um, caught into this trap of having to travel all the time. And there's another element which uh, Putnam does not insist on or even mention, but that seems to be very important, is that when you have an existence that is spread across long distances, you simply feel less involved in your community. You live here, but if you work elsewhere, you're not too interested in developing relationships here, right? And if you work there, you are not too interested in being a responsible entrepreneur because in any case, the impacts of your activity will not be felt on your children that are going to school here, right? So the fact that you are spread more than in the past, and that's made easier because highways have developed and we all have individual cars and so on, means that you have less incentive to invest in building at a local level social relations, okay? So space, Spatial organization of time matters. That's the second major explanation. Thirdly, there is television. Um, it's true that in the 70s, 80s especially, and 90s, it took more and more time. And the more time people spend before the TV, the less time they spend chatting with neighbors. Um, um, and... Um, uh, the, 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 for, for the young generation, particularly the adolescents, this has been a major reason why they've uh, simply developed less of a civic spirit, right? Simply the time they spend before the TV does not allow for this. Um, and uh, I was mentioning to my students uh, some minutes ago, actually, that, that the, the, the average uh, US adolescent today spends almost three hours per day before the TV. Um, but, you know, we should not blame the U.S. in particular. Uh, we all are wedded to our screens, uh, but that is much more ambiguous to, to assess the impact of the Internet because it also is a means to build social relationships. So I think the impacts are much more uh, ambiguous. So these are the three explanations Putnam gives for the loss of social capital. Now, he then says, okay, so I, I managed to explain a number of things, but he says... This doesn't explain it all. We also have a generational change that's taking place, and we probably need other explanations. Now, 
This is very mysterious. What does it mean? I believe you can only understand the erosion of social capital, the reduced investment in collective action in the 80s and 90s, by relating this to the disappointment people have experienced from public action of the 1970s. People were disappointed. Why were they disappointed? Well, maybe because um, they were not able to revolutionize society. Maybe because the political parties in the uh, 80s and 90s were all defending uh, the very, very comparable programs. So there was an absence of political alternatives making it less worthwhile to invest in you know, political action. It was just less attractive. There may be uh, those reasons why privatization was so um, important in this, in this period. Um, I also think that given that this period was dominated by a neoliberal ethos, the idea that um, the best way to contribute to the common good was to grow the economy, to make profits for society to grow and for the GDP per capita to increase, people were just reassured that it was morally right to focus on private wealth, a teaching that we have received from Bernard de Monville already in 1713, um, one of the inspirations for um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, of course. So it's not a new thing, but what's new is the, the, the very um, important um, weight uh, of authors justifying basically selfishness and the retreat on um, private preoccupations. And then we come to our period. So imagine that what I said is more or less plausible to explain these generational shifts. What is then our situation? I would say that we are disappointed with consumerism, for sure. We are also disappointed, however, with um, public action that was used in the 1970s. But we are tired of this individualistic ethos of the 80s and 90s, and we are trying to do something else. But the reason why we are trying to do something else differently is because of all this experience we've accumulated and these lessons taught from recent history. So what is this new thing we are trying to develop? I call it active democracy. And active democracy is something else than representative democracy in which people go to the, to the vote every four or five years, vote for some people to think in their name and, and decide on their behalf, and then impose top-down solutions that people have to accept remaining passive between two election periods. No, people are tired of this. Active democracy means people want to do things, not being told what to do. They want to invent their own solutions, not wait for them to be dumped on them from the above. So they are looking for something different. And we only can understand our situation if we grasp the reasons why people are dissatisfied with politics as usual. Right? Militants today, including in particular those wanting to change the food systems, they are not willing just to vote for certain parties, political programs, and they don't trust politicians anymore. That's why they want to do things by themselves. They are just too impatient to wait. And I think there are um, five reasons for this. Let me very briefly um, uh, mention them. First of all, there is a, a, an awareness today that politics are captured. Um, we have studies that have tried to examine the responsiveness of politicians to respectively public opinion as measured by opinion polls and to the expectations of the corporate sector, the big economic actors. Benjamin Page and Martin Gillens, for example, published a whole book on this um, in which they 
present the results of a study they present also in this article in Perspectives on Politics, 1,779 dossiers, policy issues, were examined by these authors. And for each, they asked the following question. What did the public want, as measured by opinion polls, and what did companies want, as expressed by their lobbies? And they tested the decisions made by politicians against those two sets of expectations for 1,779 dossiers, starting in the 1980s. And as about citizen preferences, this is what they found, right? Um, they found that when less than 20% people wanted a particular decision to be adopted, the, the, the chances of um, the decision being adopted was not very high. But when 90% of the population wanted a particular solution to be adopted, the chances were not very high either. Basically, this is flat, showing the lack of responsiveness of politicians to people's <coughs> demands. They did the exact same test on the exact same issues, but looking at what corporations had expressed as wishes, and this is what they arrived at. When less than 20% of the corporations hope for a certain outcome, the chances are very slim that the decision shall be made. When 90% of the corporations express a hope, the chances are much higher that the measure shall be adopted. In other terms, depressingly, politicians are much more um, sensitized to the expectations of the economic elites than um, to those of the average citizen. Of course, one might add, many politicians belong to this elite, so it's also self-serving, uh, but it is a very uh, depressing view that people sense even before Benjamin Page and Martin Gillens could publish the results of their research. There's something else, and this may be the explanation also for this, uh, these charts, which is that um, in many cases, the, the, the tendency for politicians has been to resort to what political scientists call the, the garbage can logic of decision making. In other terms, they decide for certain solutions based not on a vision of what's good for the future and then an understanding of which tools should be deployed to reach that vision, they decide on the basis of what convenient solutions are presented to them. And that's the garbage can logic, right? They just choose uh, for certain solutions based on what is the easy solution at hand. And in the food sector, it's very clear that when large agribusiness corporations present to politicians a solution to feed a planet of 10 billion, um, politicians are eager to embrace those solutions, particularly if they are politically not too sensitive and if um, technological fixes can remedy problems that are in fact of political nature. So I think that's, a, that's one other reason that in part explains this sensitivity to the uh, preferences of the economic elites. Uh, thirdly, um, very often, um, Political decision making, and this is particularly true in the food sector, is highly dependent on how the problem is framed. And um, again, this is a, this is a, related to the food, uh, the debate on the future of food. It's a, a one figure you find in the IPS Food Report from Uniformity to Diversity, in which we try to look at the reasons why agroecological alternatives were not being explored as they should, despite all the promises. Um, and we identified a number of lock-ins, or reasons why um, governments were not doing more to support agroecology. And part of the most important reasons have to do with how the problem is presented to politicians. For example, they are told that the food sector needs to build its ability to export on global markets. And, and, and politicians will be asked to support the solutions that can 
basically support the champions that can sell or, or, or capture larger portions of the markets um, in the world. Or they're told that they should encourage solutions for cheap food, right? So, so that low-income families can feed themselves decently, we need to favor productivist solutions, um, fitting in what I call the low-cost food economy. Or they're told, this is a very powerful narrative, that we need to feed the world. And of course, more farmers cannot feed the world. Only, you know, Monsanto, Syngenta, and BASF can actually provide the technologies that shall feed a planet of 10 billion, so let us trust the solutions that they have invested in. Um, politicians are asked to measure success by productivity increases or by improvements in labor productivity, not by other measures of success, such as sustainable food production, um, healthy diets, um, uh, or, um, um, for example, uh, better incomes for small-scale farmers. So all these elements have to do with the narrative, the framing of the problem, the understanding of the issue, that actually, rather than improving our understanding of the situation, narrows down political imagination by preempting, if you wish, how um, uh, problems should be addressed. How you describe the problem, of course, um, prejudges the solutions that will fit um, 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 uh, the, the problem and, and will be seen as uh, adequate solutions. So I think that is one more reason why um, politics is um, distrusted. The fourth reason um, has to do with the fact that people perceive risks, environmental risks in particular, um, differently depending on their mindset, their cultural attitude, and their social economic status. And I was personally very impressed by the work done by two psychologists uh, with others, but they are the two leading figures in this line of uh, inquiry, Paul Slovic and Dan Kahane, who in particular developed this um, provocatively called uh, white male syndrome approach to environmental misperception. Basically, what do they say? They say that the very same information about, for example, pollution or climate change or erosion of biodiversity, to take just three typical environmental risks, the very same information will be processed very differently depending on what kind of worldview you have. So, for example, if I am someone who believes in hierarchy and in individualistic solutions to social problems, I will have a perception of the problem of climate change very different than if I'm much more focused on community-based solutions and if I'm much more egalitarian in um, in my political beliefs. And actually, there's a link between those cultural attitudes and the political affiliation. Similarly, if I am doing very well, as I am, as a white male, that's affluent, um, my perception of the environmental risk will be very different than that of a poor person who will be facing uh, uh, the most serious problems in case of um, you know, environmental destruction. So, um, we understand or do not understand uh, risk differently depending on whom we are, which status we have in society, what is our worldview, and particularly what they highlight is that if we feel we are threatened by a particular message, we shall reject that message. We are very good or I should say perhaps our brains are very good at protecting ourselves from information that is making us feel guilty about whom we are and what we do. Um, and so the elites in wealthy societies know perfectly well that if everyone was adapting, adopting sorry, their lifestyles, we would need not two plants as we do today. We would need eight or ten plants, right, to support those lifestyles. They know this. 
yet they refuse to pose the fundamental questions about the economic and political organization of societies because they feel threatened. And it's so um, uncomfortable right, to ask these questions, they prefer to reject them. I suspect that the public is now understanding that it, it shall not improve politicians' reactions to have you know, the IPCC doing more glossy reports or to have better looking graphs. It will not serve your aims as food activists to make fantastic PowerPoint presentations before the, the leaders of the world at the CFS if you don't understand that these people are in a privileged position, they have nothing to fear, in fact, from climate change, that be serious. Um, and they will resist any information because it's not, you know, it's not something interesting to them, in fact. They will understand it at an intellectual level. They will subsidize the, you know, follow-up study to a glossy brochure they've been presented with. But they will not change things. They will not see the urgency. They will not perceive it in a way people who are really threatened might. Um, so I think that is um, a, a fifth reason why uh, politics is um, distrusted. And then finally, and this is perhaps at the heart of the issue, but it's more difficult for me to explain. Um, I think we've been um, gradually um, uh, tired of politics as was done in the 18th and 19th century. Um, let me explain this by uh, recalling that in the um, 18th century, when we invented democracy, there were 